From welcoming refugees with open arms to potentially breaking laws to keep them out. Denmark passes legislation that will see vulnerable refugees returned home and those seeking asylum sent to processing centers in Africa. Are they in violation of EU rules? And could their actions pave the way for other countries to follow suit? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Denmark's controversial anti-immigration laws. Denmark has passed a law allowing for the deportation of asylum seekers to offshore centers outside the EU. Reminiscent of Australia's controversial policy on Manus and Nauru Islands, the Social Democrat-led government has signed an agreement with Rwanda to host Danish asylum seekers, regardless of their country of origin, while their claims are being processed. Now, it's a move that's drawing condemnation from human rights groups, the United Nations, and the European Commission. External processing of asylum claims raises fundamental questions about both the access to asylum procedures and effective access to protection. It is not possible under existing EU rules or proposals under the new pact uh, for, on migration and asylum. Meanwhile, Syrians are protesting legislation that could see them sent back to war-torn Syria. Denmark is the first country in Europe to revoke residency permits of refugees from the greater Damascus region which Danish authorities have now declared safe. That assessment was based on a 2019 government report, but 11 of its 12 contributors have withdrawn their recommendations, and the 12th is a Syrian general who heads the country's immigration department. Danish Prime Minister Mette Frederiksen and her Social Democrat government have made it clear their target is zero refugees, claiming migrants and asylum seekers undermine the country's societal cohesion and strain the welfare system. It's a sentiment supported by the left and the right, and it's led to fears that other European countries might try to do the same. So let's discuss Denmark's controversial new approach to immigration, and joining me now from Amman, Jordan, is Sarah Kayali. She is a Syria researcher at Human Rights Watch. In Istanbul is Martin lemberg Peterson. He's an associate professor at the Center for Advanced Migration Studies at the University of Copenhagen. And in Copenhagen, we have Anne-Sophie Alarp. She is a political commentator and journalist who formerly served as international secretary for Denmark's Social Democrat Party. Important to note as well that we invited representatives from the Danish government, but they declined, unfortunately. But thanks all so much to uh, the three of you for, for being with us to talk about this very important development. I mean, there's so much missing in these proposals. First that the Danish government doesn't even recognize uh, the Syrian regime, in large part because of human rights violations, uh, yet they're saying now it is safe enough to actually send people back to the country. Then, you know, looking at the option of offshore detention, center, I mean, this, this pending agreement with Rwanda, it's still in complete legal limbo from everything I have been able to, uh, to read and research. And uh, part of that agreement being that if the asylum is approved, applicants still won't be able to return to Denmark. They'll only be approved to stay in that third country. Uh, could any of this really become enforceable? Or, uh, and Sophie, let me start with you. Is this a political strategy that also in part serves to scare off asylum seekers? Yes, I think that's uh, exactly what the intent is as uh, a lot of other legislation that we've passed over the past, uh, say, 10, 15 years. Uh, that's the sole purpose. And, and the idea is to solve the migration problem uh, by uh, instituting this type of, uh, of system that is to deter people from trying to, uh, to uh, apply for asylum in Denmark. Uh, it is to, to also be stated that, uh, that this is a very sketchy uh, framework. Uh, the law is... Uh, I think falls below what the minimum criteria for a law is, namely that it has to legislate uh, and regulate something uh, because uh, there is no fixed set agreement to transfer uh, refugees yet with uh, Rwanda or another African country. But the government is uh, consulting uh, with, uh, with both Rwanda and other countries, they've said. 
Right, Martin, let me get your take on that. I mean, could any of this really be enforceable, I mean, in, in practice? Well, that's uh, one of the key questions, Andrea. And I, I think I want to share what Sophia said, that that sentiment is to, to, tear, to put apart apples and oranges here. So there is a legislation on the offshoring, but that legislation does not mention any specific country. Then there is a memorandum of understanding recently signed with uh, Rwanda that sort of uh, took place around the same time as the legislation was discussed in parliament. But that memorandum does not mention anything about offshoring centers, and Rwanda certainly doesn't commit to anything like it. Uh, we should also note that the Social Democratic Party, also after in government, have mentioned numerous countries as potential partners, and then only found that these countries have rejected anything to do with the Danish proposal. In the original proposal, uh, the campaign leading in, in 18 and 19, they also mentioned partnership with the UNHCR and the EU, and both actors have also rejected anything to do with the plans. So they are indeed very sketchy. And I think beyond the point of communicating to refugees, I think perhaps a bigger point is to communicate to domestic Danish voters. And, and I think that applies to the, the Syrian this decision as well, because if there is no recognition of the Assad regime from the Danish government side, there is no readmission agreement either. And that means that the Syrians from greater Damascus area will be placed in Danish departure centers for we don't know how long. Right. And Sarah, I mean, after all that was heard and seen about, you know, Nauru and Manos Islands, their processing centers there, I mean, it was a disgrace. And, you know, all the miserable press that that brought Australia. Why would Denmark even pitch this, especially from a human rights perspective? I mean, from a human rights perspective, the scheme is very clearly problematic. The other types of measures that we've seen implemented schemes similar to this uh, have resulted in numerous human rights violations. But what's clear to us from both this decision, this law, and the decision to revoke temporary protection status for Syrians in Denmark is that Denmark is on a race to the bottom. Um, it is. It is now has some of the harshest anti-immigration policies in all of Europe, and none of it appears to be just justifiable in a fact-based manner. Right. And uh, back to Anne-Sophie, I mean, you also pointed out the sheer expense of this type of program. It certainly doesn't save the Danish taxpayer any money. So why is it in the public interest? I think one has to understand that this is this follows a long process domestically uh, in terms of uh, of the political dynamic between the parties uh, in in parliament. We have a multi-party system. We have many different parties, uh, and we've had an increased uh, competition between the parties in appearing to the Danish electorate. Uh, more tough on migration than the other party. I also want to declare myself that I'm not no longer a member of the Social Democratic Party. I quit back in uh, 2015, citing political differences. But um, th this is the background. This is why uh, we've come to a, a point where we are drawing this type of attention to ourselves from a, a, a across the world. Um, and uh, and to understand uh, why we see this uh, this the um, placement of the refugees from, from Syria in these deportation centers and also uh, uh, this quite difficult uh, process towards finding uh, some sort of a partner in Africa uh, to, to place uh, asylum seekers in. Uh, one has to understand that this, this follows uh, maybe 10 or 15, maybe even 20 years uh, of like increasing, one might call it radicalization, um, one might call it populism, or, or some other people would call it realism. Um, right. in, in Danish politics. Yeah, it's, it's, and Sophie, you did, you spent 12 years with the Social Democrat Party. I, I have right. to ask you personally, what you actually make mm -hmm. of your party today? Well, I think I've called them center populist, um, and I, I think they are a, a sort of a national collectivist center populist party today, and and uh, fall quite uh, outside the 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 norm of what one would understand as a social democratic party mm -hmm. in many different policy uh, aspects: foreign policy, value policy, uh, justice policy, foreign foreigners, uh, migration. Sounds you sounds like you think they've lost their way. 
uh, to put it mildly. Well, I, I disagree, but uh, they are very popular. Yeah. I think that's also uh, an important thing. They are more popular than they've been for decades. Okay, I actually would like to look now at what your government has had to say on this issue. We were given a statement from uh, the Office of the Minister for Immigration and Integration, Matthias Tesfaye. I'll read that to you now. The, it's, he says, the current asylum system has failed. It is inefficient and unfair. Children, women, and men are drowning in the Mediterranean or are abused along the migratory routes while human traffickers earn fortunes. Denmark and the EU in general spend many resources on processing asylum applications due to the hundreds of thousands of asylum seekers registered annually in the EU, although half of them turn out not to be refugees. Martin, let me direct this to you then. I mean, that sounds like uh, a strong enough rationale uh, for trying to curb immigration uh, and asylum seeking in Denmark. It is also a pretty generic rationale that uh, we have heard from the government even before it was in government, so for the last four or five years. And it is a, a humanitarian argument, to be clear. It is the argument that the government is actually intervening in an unfair and broken down asylum system. I think we need to pause here and look at the reasons why there are trouble with the current asylum system, why people have to depend on smugglers and irregular routes that are certifiably very life-threatening. And here, a major reason is, of course, that countries like Denmark and a range of other European countries have closed down legal escape routes. Mm -hmm. The reason why people have to resort to smugglers is that this is the only way they can access their rights to asylum. So it uh, rings a little hollow when the, when the government is putting all the blame on the human smugglers for a collapsed system, when in reality, the Danish government, alongside many other European governments, have closed down the possibility to apply for asylum of, on embassies, on consulate, have sliced down on UN quota refugees. And then also there is the argument that the, this sort of offshore center would undermine the business model of smugglers. And I'd have to say that the, the indications we know from other externalization pilots, the Australian policy, or also Israel's failed policy with Rwanda some years ago, it indicates the exact opposite. Namely, that uh, this kind of uh, offshore center will be inserted as another level of irregular migration routes, because the experiences we know from these other places is it actually accelerates a loss of control. It accelerates people's attempts to try once more uh, through dangerous migration routes. So I have right. to say the argument is, is, is humanitarian, but once you poke at it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't add up. And Sarah, I mean, organizations like Human Rights Watch have been so vocal uh, about trying to rebut those, those arguments that governments like Denmark's uh, are making right now. Why has it been so hard to convince so much of the voting public uh, that this is not actually helping refugees, it's not curbing human trafficking, it's making the situation almost worse for everybody involved. Because the reality is that these these kinds of policies and these kinds of decisions are really based on, on fear-mongering. Um, and it's very easy to blame um, all domestic trouble, all domestic issues on the other. And in this case, the other are the refugees. This is probably the easiest way that you can get away with talking about anything, be it unemployment, economic issues, political difficulties. Um, it's very easy um, to do this on, on the basis of emotions rather than on the basis of facts. And this is what what we've seen across the board. I mean, with the, with the Danish statement in particular, if Denmark really wanted um, to help refugees and allow them not to get um, to Europe, they should be resolving the underlying causes of these conflicts and putting in greater commitments and greater resources towards that instead of, instead of um, ensuring that they are ejected um, from, from Denmark. Um, and, and I of think course, though, I mean, Sarah, they're going to say, as they have said, you know, we can't solve other countries' problems. We've heard this from almost every developing country in the world. We can't solve the war in Syria. This is a Syrian problem. And you'll hear Syrians agree with that to, to a certain extent as well. Um, so really, what, what are the actual solutions then? Uh, what do you think the Danish government can do to appease the public's concerns and also 
be the proper, you know, take the humanitarian action that they're actually obligated to take by law? The role that the Danish government should really play in this in this particular context is rely on on facts, rely on international law in creating these policies, and be very transparent with the public that what they are advocating for, what they want, is really not going to work. Um, I personally know of Syrian refugees who've attempted dozens of times to cross Europe, even more. I know of a pregnant woman who's jumped off of a wall to be able to get to Europe to escape the violence that 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 she's found in Syria, um, and that's not going to be resolved even if they if if they deport them. So the reality is that these policies don't work, and the Danish government has to communicate this to the public, has to rely on facts in creating these policies instead of the fear mongering that we've seen thus far. And Sarah, quickly, I mean, while Denmark tries to argue that the greater Damascus area is now safe, tell us what people will return to if they are forced to return. The reality is, as Human Rights Watch has documented, is that Syria and Damascus and Damascus countryside are not safe at all. If these Syrians were to be deported and reach Damascus, they are likely to be arbitrarily arrested at checkpoints, harassed and tortured. These kinds of abuses continue to this day. This is in addition to the catastrophic humanitarian situation that we are seeing in, in Syria as a whole and in Damascus in particular. It's more catastrophic than it's been in the last decade. Um, people can't find bread, they can't find fuel, there is no electricity. So the idea that Damascus or Damascus countryside is safe is really not based in reality at all. Okay. Martin, let me ask you this. Um, why or how have asylum seekers been an actual problem? And anne Sophie, I want you to speak to this as well, of course, because you are in Copenhagen. Um, why have they actually been a problem for, for the Danish population? I mean, other than a lack of you know, facilities for them, are they putting Danes at risk? Are they costing society that much? Yeah, that is a good question, because certainly if you look at the discourses and the rhetoric and the media campaigns emanating from the government, and uh, I would say across the center and to the right wing, you will get the impression of this, that, uh, that there is a lot of crime involved and so on. But actually, when you then talk to local municipalities and the societies where, where these people are, it's not as big a problem as it is in the national media campaign. And I think uh, what this speaks into is a core argument that we're hearing from the government, which is something like loss of control, that immigration indicates a loss of control. And I, I just want to point out that both of the Syrian deportation policy and this new legislation, if pursued, they are, I think, actually going to accelerate the fact that people will go underground they won't have any trust or any belief in the Danish asylum system anymore. They are being told that they are going to be placed in deportation centers or they're going to be sent to offshore camps. So people might actually, this might create incentives for people to go underground, to work irregularly, precariously, live like that, maybe move to other countries who aren't too keen to see Denmark spread the responsibility like that. So I think this kind of policy a drive that we're seeing on both of these counts is actually accelerating one of the, the biggest fears of this uh, social democratic government, which is loss of control. Right. I mean, and Sophie, is there any truth, though, to what the government has argued about the damage to social cohesion, the, the stress on the economy? Um, are there some factors there that perhaps the government has been able to exploit to overplay the so-called damage they think is being done to Denmark because of the immigration crisis? Well, certainly there is a, a greater unemployment rate among many different minorities uh, in, in Denmark. So, so clearly one cannot uh, neglect that there is a certain burden uh, on uh, the economy from some groups. Um, it's also obviously very difficult to then... Uh, balance out how much other groups contribute to the economy, because I, I think many different sectors, service, uh, trade, uh, the health sector, uh, would be a virtually impossible a construction without migrants. Um, so it's very, it's quite, it's a, it's a mixed uh, um, balance of, uh, of uh, 
of both uh, income and, and expenditure. And I think it's quite difficult to say. There's been figures uh, thrown around in the Danish uh, public discourse of, uh, of uh, 12 or 16 or 20 billion a year uh, in uh, minus uh, on that uh, calculation. Um, it's very difficult to say, I think. Um, what is uh, clear is that uh, crime has been falling um, for, for decades and also that many different uh, minorities, uh, second, third generation, are being are educating themselves very well. Yes. Um, and, uh, and also I think there's been maybe uh, we are not as a, as a population uh, very um, used to um, great uh, waves of migration and we haven't emigrated either. It, to a very large extent, we were the Scandinavian country that went the least to the U.S. 100, 150 years back, um, where Sweden and Norway went much more. We we are sort of home dwellers, and we've not we're not used to uh, a big uh, migration uh, like the one that we've experienced for the uh, past 20, 40 years. Okay. So um, so I'm, I'm... so that's part of the I think that's part of the understanding us. So we, it's not, we are not as globalist, not as open um, as, uh, as our appearance uh, could uh, suggest. Very interesting. Because, I mean, it does. I mm. mean, in, in, if there is a way to say in the public's defense here, it, did, it mm -hmm. did sneak up on some people. I mean, this immigration crisis got so bad so fast that if how you're describing uh, the Danish people, um, you can imagine, it, can, it could be slightly understandable that people would suddenly... Uh, come in for a shock and, and have, feel they have to react and be scared. It's understandable. But now the problem is Denmark has kind of set this example by taking these, these more extreme measures. And um, Sarah, are, is Human Rights Watch especially concerned that other countries are going to see if they can imitate uh, this lead that Denmark has taken? Yes, indeed. I mean, thus far, Denmark has really been an outlier in, in Europe uh, in terms of the policies that they've adopted. But they are setting a model for other populist um, countries to really move in that direction, um, to really um, demean the international protection system for refugees and undermine it. Um, and our concern is that this will only be the first of many. Um, this really is a slippery slope, and that's why um, these policies must be reversed urgently. Right. Martin, what are your concerns on that front, that if, if any legitimacy is set with, with this policy, who's going to follow suit and how, how much do you fear that they will actually be able to take these actions? Well, those are those are two uh, actually different questions, both very good. I think uh, we should we should be aware that this proposal of externalization um, and, and actually also of, of mass deportation actually has some years on the back. Uh, I think a Danish government proposed it back in 86, back then and through the 90s and up until the zeros. It was supported by a very few uh, handful of governments, including Netherlands and the United Kingdom. And um, it, they didn't materialize because there was so much international resistance against them. Now, in today's world, we're seeing that after Brexit, the UK is uh, in dire need of, uh, of new partnerships. And they're also beginning to talk about offshoring. Uh, Denmark is desperately in need of political legitimacy. So pointing to anyone agreeing with them is definitely a strategy, and they have appealed to the UK. Also, there has been some collaboration with Austria. And uh, Hungary has uh, expressed support of the Danish uh, attempt to deport Syrians. What I see is the risk of a fracture of international collaboration uh, on refugeehood and displacement. And mind you, this is really an area where no country can work it alone. There is a need of international collaboration. So uh, when you hear the European Commission and the UNHCR, their concern is that the Danish unilateralism and even if they succeed to gather a small alliance of countries, is going to undermine the international collaboration. That's the EU's migration pact, says the Commission, and the UNHCR says this is against the law and the, the letter and the spirit right. of the 1951 Refugee Convention. And Sophie, I'll finish with you. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. Amnesty International very keenly pointed out that uh, this perpetuates the idea that rich countries can pay their way out of international obligations. 
Now, sometimes they argue those obligations, uh, they don't have to take that seriously. We've seen many times in the case of Hungary in particular, uh, that they can forge their own path. I mean, how dangerous is that for Denmark to kind of take this lead and actually convince its public that, hey, we are going to take care of you by buying our way out of this? I think there's been a, a breakdown uh, over time in in sort of the propensity to to look at details uh, in the political discourse, uh, not only here but in many places. And and uh, basically, we are not uh, looking at the full picture. I think uh, because obviously this is going to um, not only pave the way to other European countries, but to many different countries in the world to say, well, we might have an obligation, but we're not really taking it very seriously. And right. that is going to uh, destabilize the greater system. But I also want to add that this is a very difficult system to put in place. It's going to uh, twin us with uh, possibly with an African nation uh, over time, uh, foreign politically, which is a very uh, delicate um, uh, exercise. Yeah. And it's also going to be extremely expensive uh, okay. for us. I don't think any African country is not going to take uh, a good uh, salary for right. that um, service. And so I'll have to wrap you there. So unfortunately, we're out of time uh, for this edition of the program. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists so much for being with us on The Newsmakers. And thanks, of course, to our viewers for being with us as well. We'll see you next time.